a complex manifold, then X is Stein. Uh, if and only if X is bihomomorphic to a closed complex submanifold in some CNN. This is a quick and dirty definition of this. What a Stein manifold is. So, um, of course, it's not a projective manifold since you can never get to some complete manifold in CNN. So it's far, it's far from being projective. And it's the homomorphic analog of a smooth complex affine variety. I mean, smooth complex affine varieties are examples of Stein manifolds. Um, and you can also define what it means for a complex space to be Stein. This is a little more, I wouldn't have to say some technicalities, but I won't say them. I'll just say it's the analog of a complex affine variety. So it's sort of a Stein manifold that you allow singular. I can't say it's embeddable in CN because it might have too many singularities. It's locally embeddable in CN, but then you, you need to say some global conditions. But just think of a precise space, think of a complex affine variety. It's certainly okay. So the old principle uh, has been around for a long time. People like to sum it up uh, in the following way. If you want to reduce uh, Stein space, which means there aren't any null potents in the structure. So on a reduced Stein space, there are only topological obstructions to solving a holomorphic problem that can be formulated in terms of homology. So it's a very powerful fact. It says that, that uh, to do something in the holomorphic domain is only obstructed by topology. That's a very powerful, powerful fact. So let me give you uh, Broward's theorem, which is a very strong form of the open principle. It's really a fantastic result of Broward's from the late uh, 60s. So you let G be a complex Lie group and X to reduce uh, sign space. Then the theorem of Broward says the following. Well, you can consider isomorphism classes of holomorphic principal G bundles on X. Or you can consider isomorphism classes of topological principal G bundles on X. And the theorem of Broward says that's, it's all the same. So, more precisely, I certainly have an inclusion between uh, holomorphic principal G bundles and topological principal G bundles, just forgetting the holomorphic structure. And it says on isomorphism classes, this is an isomorphism. So in other words, every topological principle G model on X has a holomorphic structure. And two holomorphic structures are holomorphically isomorphic if and only if you can find actually just a topological isomorphism between the two principal models. So this is a really famous theorem of Broward. Now, why is this an open principle? Note that isomorphism classes principal G bundles are given by a certain cohomology set, H1 of X with values in G, where G is the sheaf of groups. And the sheaf of groups is just maps of open subsets of X into the group. If you take holomorphic maps of open sets of X into the group, then the H1 gives you the isomorphism classes of holomorphic principal G bundles. If you take continuous maps into the group, then that gives you the, um, the H1 then gives you topological principle G bundles. So the question of whether or not a topological G bundle has a whole morphic structure or not is really uh, a problem about uh, comparing two cohomology sets. So it's an example of an open principle because all, all the uh, data we're, we're dealing with is an H1 with values in some sheaf groups. Okay, so I said it there with Broward is, is an open principle. Now there's a, also an equivariant version of the open principle to, to Heinz and Kutchabow. I don't want to say too much about it. But of course, you can have principal bundles on X, and you can have another group acting. You have another complex lead group acting 
inversion of Broward's theorem with this exclusivity group hanging around. So there's an equivariant inversion of Broward's own principle between Heinz Kern and, and Bushkov, which will come in later. So, if I have a closed orbit and it has an isotropic group, let's call it 
because you can see glass and it's isotropy. And I stratify the quotient by lumping together all the points which have the same isotropy group up to commutation. So I have a stratification of the quotient space by, by the class of the isotropy groups. That's a natural thing to do. And it turns out that the stratification is a locally finite stratification of Z by locally closed smooth subvarieties. So the quotient space Z can be pretty horribly complicated, but the strata are nice, smooth manifolds. And in fact, if you look at the closure of one strata, if you look at the boundary of the strata, it's a union of other strata. So it's a very nice stratification. So let me give you um, an example, or well, one of the simplest in the world. So let G be just the non-zero complex numbers, the group on the multiplication. And let V be C2, where uh, T and C star acts on the points by multiplying the first, uh, the first entry by T and the second entry by T inverse. So let x and y be the corresponding uh, coordinate functions. Then I want to look at the polynomial. Oh, so O v means the polynomial functions on v. So this is just this is just polynomials in x and y. And I want to find out what polynomials in x and y are left <laughs> invariant under the, the action of this group. But of course, the only way to kill the action of the group is to multiply the guy who's, who's being multiplied by t times the guy who's being multiplied by t inverse. So the invariant uh, polynomial functions on v are generated by the polynomial x times y. So any invariant polynomial is, a, is just a polynomial on x times y. There's nothing else you can do to kill the action of the group. So let pi be the polynomial x, y, mapping v to z equals c. So match v to c and I call c z. Then um, it's a theorem that if I pull back the holomorphic functions on c by this invariant, I'm just going to, I'm going to get exactly the g invariant holomorphic functions on v. It's a theorem. Luna, essentially. So what I've done is I've constructed the quotient for you. This is the quotient. So I have to tell you why it has the right points, why it has the right, how it corresponds to the closed orbit. So if I have a non-zero closed orbit, make the same typo again, g times x, not g sub x. So the non-zero closed orbits, g x, have trivial isotropy group. If I have a, a closed orbit uh, t times a and b, then uh, um, a then, then well of course they can't both be zero, so that means that the isotropy group is trivial. So they have trivial isotropy group. However, there's one other closed orbit which is named the origin, and of course its isotropy group is g because g fixes the origin. So the strata, so Z does correspond to the closed orbits, and the stratification of Z has two strata. One is zero, corresponding to the having G as the isotropic group, and the other strata is C minus zero, where the corresponding isotropic groups are trivial. So that's an example of a quotient space of a representation, and here's the stratification. Generally, the quotient space is not going to be smooth. This is a, somewhat of an exception. But there is, there's always a nice stratification. So let Y be another Stein G manifold with quotient mapping, which I'll call pi Y, mapping Y to Z. I want it to have the same quotient, the same quotient space as X. So I want to be able to identify the two quotient spaces. So I just say they have the same quotient space, Z. And I also want another condition. I want to say that X and Y are locally isomorphic over Z. If we 
very strong local conditionals. Namely, I have an open covering of the quotient space, so this open covering is called UI, and over each open set UI, I have an isomorphism of the inverse image of that open set. So pi x inverse UI is sitting inside x, pi y inverse UI is sitting inside y, and I want a g by holomorphic map which induces the identity on the quotient. So, there, so that says that x and y are just locally the same as much as you could possibly want them to be. Locally, they're the same. And, we, and the point of our work is to find an open principle for the situation. And we want to find, it's sort of clear from the setup that the obstruction that x and y being isomorphic should somehow be global because there are no local obstructions. They're, they're perfectly isomorphic locally. So the hope for open principle is that x and y are g by holomorphic by a map to x to y which reduces the identity on the quotient if and only if the topological condition is satisfied. That's the, that's what we're looking for. Now, I want to um, say this homologically. So, if I have an open set in the quotient, let f of u denote the g-equivariant bihomomorphic maps of the inverse image of u, which induce the identity on the quotient. So this is a sheet, again, a sheet of groups. So I look at, over an open set in the quotient, I look at all the g-equivariant mappings, which uh, induce the identity downstairs. So somehow in each fiber, of the mapping to the quotient, I'm moving the fiber around inside itself in a g equivariant way. But that's more or less all I can do. So remember, I have my local isomorphisms psi i. So if I look, if I look at psi i inverse composed with psi j, what is this? This is a, a self map of u i intersect u j. Uh, sorry, of the inverse image of ui intersect uj into itself. So it's an element of f of ui intersect uj. So I get a uh, co-cycle, psi ij, in, uh, well, I get, I get a cohomology class in h1 of zf. So I have this chief of local uh, isomorphisms over the quotient, and from my local isomorphisms of x and y, I get this, this cohomology class in H1ZF. And then it's an easy exercise to show that there's an equivariant biholomorphic map from x to y, which induces the identity on the quotient, if and only if this cohomology class is trivial, if and only if my uh, Cycle psi ij is a co-boundary. Okay, so the question of whether or not x and y are isomorphic is whether or not a certain cohomology class vanishes. But of course, this is a holomorphic question. These are holomorphic maps. So let me give you an example which is more or less Broward's theorem regurgitated. So let Let's look at a special case where x and y are holomorphic principal g bundles over the sign manifold z. So then the, the quotient space is certainly the base, right? If I take the principal bundle, I divide by the group, you get the base. So the, the orbit space of x by g and the orbit space of y by g are all my sign manifold z. And x and y as sign g manifolds are locally isomorphic over z because of Holomorphic principle G bundle is locally trivial, so they're locally they're locally the same, no problem. So X is G by holomorphic to Y over Z. If and only if the two holomorphic principle bundles are isomorphic, right? If you ask, how can I find a mapping from X to Y, uh, which is G by holomorphic? Well, that has to be a mapping of principle G bundle. So x is g by holomorphic to y over z, if and only if the two holomorphic principles
But by Brouwer, this is if and only if the principal bundles are G homeomorphic. So this is if and only if X is G homeomorphic to Y over Z. So I solve the homeomorphic problem if and only if I can solve the um, homeomorphism problem. So here's an Oga principle for uh, principal G bundles viewed as an Oga principle for math between two Stein uh, G manifolds. So the idea is to generalize it to a more general situation. <clears throat> so now I have to tell you where, under what conditions we can do this. So remember I, I defined my stratification with the quotient z of, of, of x and f, of x and y. Well, the, the, the strata are, um, are sub-manifolds. And they're locally finite, and they exhaust Z, so there's got to be one stratum, which is, there's got to be a stratum that's open. Okay, so there's an open stratum, which I call, which is always called the principal stratum. It corresponds to those closed orbits whose isotropy group is the smallest. Okay, so there's a unique open stratum called the principal stratum, and I define the principal points of X to be just the inverse image. So we say that X is generic if the principal stratum of X consists of closed orbits with trivial isotropy group. And the co-dimension of the remaining stuff is at least two. So what this says is there's an open subset of X called XPR, where every orbit in there is closed. And in fact, isomorphic to the group. The, the isotropic group is trivial. And then the only other thing I ask is that if I look at the at all the uh, orbits which are not uh, closed and isomorphic to the group, all this stuff has co-dimension too. So it's a pretty mild condition to to assume. Um, you can show that X is generic if and only if every Slice representation is generic, so reduced to a problem in linear algebra, so to say. And, um, well, X, XPR to ZPR is what? That, well, every, the inverse image of every point is uh, an orbit isomorphic to G, so it's a principal G bump. So somehow it's something I, I don't understand. I mean, yes. Yeah. This is a very simple question. How can you have a closed orbit uh, with trivial isotropy? Why not? No, I did, I did the that example that. of C star, the C star action. Most of the orbits were just these hyperbolas, were just C star. Oh, yeah, no, of course, sorry. No, no, no. Yeah, no, 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 no. Okay. I substitute compact or closed to memory. Ah, no, 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 not that. Yeah. Yes, yes. Most non-compact situation. Yes, yes, yes. Possible. Now, suppose I fix the simple, well, simple D group H. And I look at H modules W, so finite dimensional representation spaces, with uh, WH equals zero, otherwise I say the super clear false. Then at the isomorphism, only finite dimension such G, H modules are not generic. So if you, if, you, if you just fix your simple group like SLNC, you look at all the representations of SLNC, which don't contain a trivial one, then there are only finitely many which are not, do not, are not generic. So generic is really generically true. And there's a similar statement for H semi-simple. So thus, in some, in some sense, saying that X is generic is getting more than 99% of the cases. 
di, well, in di we find dimension g module, and look at the holomorphic functions which transform by that irreducible level. Well, usually irreducible. Look, look at the sub, the subspace of the g finite functions that transform by these sublime. These are usually called covariates. And then I'm going to make an assumption which is more or less locally true, which means it's not really an assumption. So locally over z, I can do the following. I can find finally many irreducible representations v sub i, such that the covariance corresponding to v sub i generate the algebra of g finite functions on x, well, as a module over the invariant. Continuous homeomorphisms. 
see that phi is strongly continuous if this um, if psi i inverse composed with phi is strongly continuous. Remember, psi i is is the mapping from is the local isomorphism of the inverse image of ui and x to the inverse image of ui and y. So if I take psi inverse composed with phi, that maps pi x inverse ui to uh, pi y and the uh, pi x inverse ui. So I can say whether it's strongly continuous. And then this, this makes sense, it doesn't matter what psi I use. So I can talk about the notion of strongly continuous homeomorphisms, g homeomorphisms from x to y. And the main theorem is, if I have x and y which are generic and locally isomorphic, I'm always assuming they're locally isomorphic over z, then if I have a strongly continuous map between them, then there's an equivariant by homomorphism d prime from x to y. So the theorem is, this is the really the topological condition that you're looking for. So let me give you a couple of words about the proof. Um, so I use the slice theorem again. So let take a point x and x with a where now I finally said it correctly, g, the orbit gx closed, and let w and h be the slice representation. So h is the isotropy group. Then uh, the slice theorem says the following: there's an h-saturated open set B. In W. So A saturated means it's a union of fibers of the mapping to the quotient. H acts on W, so I have a quotient of W by H. And I, I can find that H stable, in fact, H saturated open set B contained in W, and a, um, a G isomorphism for pi x inverse U to G crossover HB, where U is the neighborhood of Z, which is the image of X. So G crossover HB is just G cross B divided by the action of H, where H acts on the right on G, or is freely and acts on the left on B, since H acts on W, on w and B is H stable sitting inside, inside W. So this is really an open set in G crossover HW, which is a homogeneous vector bundle for G. So the slice theorem says that locally X looks like G crossover HB. And we similarly have a, a exactly the same description for Y because X and Y are locally isomorphic, so they have the same slice representation and they have the same uh, local uh, structure. So Y near uh, the image of little x looks like G cross over HB. And I can use these isomorphisms to uh, think of phi as a mapping from G cross over HB to G cross over HB. So locally I'm in this situation where I have a map between these very special G manifolds, these sort of twisted bundles. And then I do something completely simple. Um, remember, the, this G cross over HP is sitting in a vector bundle, so I have the scalar action in the second argument. So let T times uh, the point, which is, which is uh, little g here and little w, the w modulo of the, the bracket GW represents the, the H orbit through G comma w. So I let my T and C star act by this scalar multiplication of the second argument. So that gives me a, an action on G cross over H B, which is more or less, if T is small, is shrinking the, the fiber down towards the zero section of the bundle. And then there's a lemma, which says the following. I have my mapping, uh, well, I call it phi, which should be let phi be phi u. So if I find 
But the existence of phi zero, which is a uh, special map, so it, the existence of phi zero shows that this class is trivial. Okay, I can solve the, I can, this, when I push the cohomology class to H, to over to GC, since I have a global map phi zero, which for, uh, which is special in, in the sense corresponding to GC, then that shows that this cohomology class is zero, which means that the original cohomology class was zero for now, which means that I have a bipolar one <coughs> So that's the, we have, that's the specific instance of the, the open principle using Heisner and Chicago. But the proof doesn't actually show that phi is homotopic to a G phi homomorphism of X and Y over Z. It doesn't show that the original map is homotopic because we go through the Heisner and Kutchabal theorem where you lose this fact. And of course, you can ask me what about actions that are non generic? So I'll tell I'll tell you the following. There's a latest theorem, right, for which I won't give you the proof, which says if I have a strongly continuous map without any generic condition on X and Y, then there's a homotopy starting with your phi and ending with the G by homomorphism X and Y over Z. So you have the full theorem that you could have a one. And then I have to tell you a couple words about what you can do differently. So we can't reduce the Heinster and Kutch about. But you, what did Heinster and Kutch about do? They took Carton's proof of Brouwer's over principle, and they made it equivariant. And they went through the proof. So what we have to do is, we have to go through the proof and modify everything to fit our situation. Now, there's a preliminary step you have to do. I can't work with a strongly continuous map and apply the methods of Carton and breaks down. I have to take the fee and I have to massage it a little bit to make it better to get the situation where we can use uh, this Carton Brower machine. So I claim that after, if I take a strongly continuous map, then after homotopy, I can arrange the following. So let C be in the quotient. Then there's a neighborhood of Z and a holomorphic map, a holomorphic self map of X uh, over UZ, which agrees with phi on the particular fiber over Z. So that says the following. Phi strongly continuous means I have a family of G isomorphisms of the fiber. The, uh, the guy with the homotopy has the following property that over each fiber, of course, I have a homotopy, but it says I, I have a G isomorphism, but it says that G isomorphism extends to a holomorphic G isomorphism in the neighborhood. Not only that, but that if I look at psi of Z of X prime for X prime close to X, then the whole thing is smooth. So what I do is I start with phi, and what I do is after homotopy, I can arrange that I have a two-parameter guy, psi of x and x prime, such that if x prime is equal to x, it's on my old friend phi, and if I fix x and let x prime vary, it's a holomorphic mapping. So that's what I, that's the massaging you have to do. And then you can apply the Brouwer proof to this kind of phi, which is an extension, and you're done. But of course, if you, there's a lot to prove in the, I mean, I'll give you an infinite detail anyway, there's even more if you do, if you do Carton for our proof. So let me, let me uh, end by uh, talking about the linearization problem, which is near and dear to the heart of everybody who works in transformation groups. So the question is, I have my reductive complex group G, how can it act on C in? Or specifically, if I have an action, a holomorphic action of G on C n, can I find a holomorphic change of coordinates such that the action of G is linear? If that's true, we say that the G action is linear on C. Okay, it's an old question. There is a nice result of Dirksen and Kuchabal, which says, no way. 
school, I don't make any topological assumptions. The, top, uh, the, top, the, I, the reason I don't need a topological assumption is, of course, the gene is contractible. So that somehow obviates the need for assuming, assuming that there's some strong that you was found. Would you eliminate the, the uh, condition of generosity in your previous theorem? Yeah, that, that was the latest theorem. Yeah, that's the latest theorem. Yeah, that's the latest theorem. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah, the latest theorem. So I don't need to. In our paper, you'll find you'll find this theorem for V generic. But in fact, you don't need it anymore. Okay, so that's very good. So the X is your equivary Bible morphic to Y, to V. And of course, I don't need to assume, so of course, if I'm talking about the linearization problem, I should say, well, X is CN. But I don't need to assume that X is CN. That comes out in the end. All I know is that X is a, a Stein G manifold, which uh, is locally isomorphic to this linear action over a common quotient. There's even a better theorem, which says the following. Suppose that V is not too small. Maybe I won't tell you they're not too small means, but again, it's a generic situation. So V is not too small, and suppose, and now I'm going to make a weaker assumption. I'm going to assume that the quotient of X by G and the quotient of Y by G are bimolomorphic. Well, I'm not assuming that they're, I'm not assuming that X and V are locally bimolomorphic over a common quotient. I'm just making an assumption about the quotient. Just saying the quotient of x by g and the quotient of v by g are biholomorphic by a mapping which preserves the Luna strat. I have to tell you what the Luna strat is. It's hard. But then x is g by holomorphic to v. So it's again a stronger theorem. It says that the Dirks and Kutchabout examples work because the quotient is horrible. Because it says as soon as the quotient is biholomorphic to a quotient of a linear action, then in fact that action is linearizable, if V is not too small. So it's a stronger theorem than the one on the previous slide. So for any simple V group G, only finitely many V with V upper G equals zero are too small. So this is more or less, again, not much of a condition on V. And simply for G sets. So, what is the Luna stratification of the quotient? Remember, our stratification of the quotient uh, used the strata which correspond to isotropy, uh, uh, conjugacy classes of isotropy, of isotropy groups. But the Luna stratification pays attention to the slice representation. But the slice representation doesn't change on irreducible components of, of ZH. So if you take the stratification ZH and you take the irreducible components, then you lump together the components which have the same slice representation, and those are the Luna strata. So I'm assuming that the, the isomorphism of X by G and V by G preserves the Luna strata, not just the isotropy type. Just, just not the isotropy type stratification. So that's that, and I think that's the end of the lecture. So thank you for your attention.
says locally they're the same. So it, it's an open principle. You know, locally they're saying there's some global obstruction to try to show the global obstruction to energy. So it would if, if we got rid of the Luna strata being isomorphic, it would be a whole different ballgame. Yeah, I mean I was wondering if probably in some nice situations you can somehow skip. Yeah, this, but, uh, but it's a question of how nice the situation must be. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't know. 